Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. What I actually want, I was <clears throat> wanted to do is to observe and discover distant objects in the universe. I will, in this brief uh, presentation, introduce you to two observatories, five observing programs, and if we have time, something else, other observations. <coughs> <coughs> The Bromberg Observatory was built in 2001, 40 km east from Pretoria on the Bromberg Ridge. This is an area which is part of the northern uh, part of the Highveld, which is a summer rain from uh, area with, uh, not, but with uh, rain and dust from the summertime, but the winter very good skies, and that's why I put them in, uh, in special uh, black. The open skies in winter is very, very good. Four or five months consecutive uh, open skies uh, there. And also the altitude of 15, 19 meters above sea level helps in uh, getting good uh, <coughs> observed conditions. <coughs> Here's a Google image uh, of the area. And the ridge actually is uh, the, the whole area here. And there is the property that we lift on and uh, this slopes down to Limit Road over about 150 meters. <coughs> As you can see, if you look from the swimming pool to the observatory, this is the, the, the mad house, the swimming pool, nice and blue. And then if you look in that direction, you will see this. This is in the direction of Covenant, which is about 40 kilometers further down. You see the, the freshly built uh, observatory with already the mounted telescope with a blue uh, reflection layer on the lens. And this is a 12 and a half inch Dobsonian which I used several years to a good extent. And I actually uh, found a supernova in that year in 2001 with this one. So visibly without these cameras. But then after we, I used the cameras uh, on the telescope on that one. <coughs> this is another view of, of the observatory, which was built in Netsville Rock, which was available there. And uh, it is a digital six with a small cell where the telescope will be uh, housed. And this idea is uh, extremely useful for doing visual observations, shielded from the wind and, and eventual stray light from that side. Stella was always there, it's a good company at night if you observe. You sit alone in an area which is actually open and accessible. And in winter morning, in the in the, length, uh, uh, in the springtime, we got nice flowers on the swell beach, and that also gave a very nice smell in the morning observation. <coughs> it was a very pleasant way of observing. <coughs> it's a roll of roof with on one side a channel with uh, roller casters in, and the other side uh, a, a rod and. Uh, we goofed uh, casters so that you have a straight run of the roll-off roof. This image uh, is, uh, that's me there, with, with my wife Bridget, which has been always very supportive on my efforts for all these years and all very grateful to that. We can also see here the height of the observatory. It's not very high. And the advantage for that is that you can access the telescope and, and change the, the telescope, uh, the accessories of it, and, and work on it. Some images of the house taken from the side where we live. I built a dry area and the stoop. And this is the old Apache telescope, which was used during the moon watch years, and which I got presented at the time. And I used it to good effect for visual observations over several years. <coughs> you can see and look at this. This is on that same area, right in the direction that I just showed you. The whole area has been combined with different owners and with a common fence around it turned into a conservancy area. We came with several, several cars, including those. And that one was six months old at the time of the photo. It was born there. 
what they often saw. That's actually amazing. <coughs> it's not so much as two uh, rainbows, but the anticrypticular rays. As you can see from the shadows, the sun is down in the southwest, and you can see the space coming on. So this is actually a good sign if you get this. Now to the hardware inside the observatory. Uh, there was a Svet Cassegrain telescope originally, with a CCD camera SD7 and a filter wheel and a strong focal reducer in order to get a flat field on this uh, telescope and also to get a wider field. But the image size on the, on the, the small tip of this uh, uh, camera is still only uh, 21 by 14 arc minutes and uh, this is um, one third of the full moon radius. So it's not too small, but it's quite, uh, it's not very large. So it cannot be used this for, let's say, comet searching or things of, of the kind. The whole system was then mounted on a pier and a wedge and polar aligned. This is an image of it, and the polar alignment, it will take some uh, five, six hours on one night to do that properly, and then you get uh, the result later, because it is very important. If you do long time observations and you are tracking uh, stars for more than five, six hours, you have to have a nearly perfect uh, setup. Also the pier mounted on a concrete uh, slab and a dew cap that you can easily make yourself. And here the train of the camera with the focal reducer. And the camera is orientated like this, so as to have always north up and east to the west images. It's very important, it helps with simple astrometry as well. So you have to make sure that this alignment is according to the axis there. After six years, the telescope broke down and was replaced. Otherwise, the whole system remained the same, except the photo reducer was uh, changed as well. Because this type of telescope, you are rather not use a flat, uh, flat field letter. You don't need it with it. The image size uh, was still half, was half of the previous setup. It looks like this, this telescope, that was mounted on the same pier. Then in 2010 we moved to the Tankaroo and built uh, our observatory there. And you can see the, diff the main difference is the altitude. It's actually nearly sea level. It's not uh, the best uh, way of for observing. And the weather in the region was expected to be not so good, but uh, in the winter it's really uh, poor weather. And uh, I'm faced with a problem which I have to attend to. I mean, so I make a plan, or otherwise I have to, s to slow down uh, what I have been doing. Now, this is a, a Kalisdorp with several wineries, green belt, the R62, and the dirt road, and that is the observatory. Looking at those pictures, it is one of the reasons why we settled there. Actually, it was a retirement settling and we looked for a compromise, a nice area on one hand and still be able to do astronomy. This is the dirt road leading to our house here, which used to be a uh, barn. And uh, we made it nice and put some buildings there. The observatory is visible. It's due west of the house, as you can see here, and it looks over it to the side. Some flowers in the region, so that is also quite attractive. And you can also see the dryness. I go fast here because I have still a lot that I must get in. The building of the piers and the telescopes. We have two telescopes there. Uh, 30 centimeters and 35, and two cameras SD8. So it's double the size of the chip of the SD7, and without using a, a focal reducer, the image size will still be the same as it originally was, about one third of the moon. So the observer programs, 
I have lined up kind of five programs. I hope I can get most of them still in here. There are two programs about cataclysmic variable stars. One of them is the long-term monitoring of them, and the other one is time series photometry to uh, quantify, uh, to measure the light curve in uh, one eye. Supernova searching, symbiotic stars, and microlensing events. Uh, variable stars, most of you know what it is. It's basically stars that change their light output due to uh, one of two reasons. It's intrinsic variable, or it is caused by outside factors. Or it, for cataclysmic violence, it is a combination of the two. This is a schematic of different uh, types of variable stars, and the eruptive cataclysmic stars are actually the main uh, type of stars that I have been uh, following. And then cataclysmic variable stars are they are part of a wide group of interacting binaries of which one of the members is a uh, white bar. The most CV systems are compact with orbital peri periods between one and a half and eight hours. If they show uh, periodic light behavior, these can be measured on one night. Most CVs undergo stages of increased activities. Dwarf Nova do that more sudden and magnetic CVs tend to evolve over periods. And it will show light curves just now. This is a schematic where you have the donor star here, which builds over material, which is picked up by the high gravitation of the white dwarf, which is actually not farther away in average than between the sun, uh, between us and the moon, that distance only. Different Differential photometry uh, is very common to every to the measurement that I do. What you require is a CCD image and uh, software to uh, do this measurement. The measurement is done by comparison of the unknown star to, to the light of a constant star that has a known uh, magnitude. For instance, this is a a star chart uh, of P1043 Centaurus, unfiltered uh, magnitudes. These are the constant start, and that is the, uh, the, the, the variable in this case, which is a uh, magnetic uh, CV. By measuring the total uh, signal on around the, the star and subtracting the background, which you measure in an analyst. You do that the same with the unknown, with the variable, and you can uh, derive the differential uh, magnitude. And doing that to more than one star, you will do that more accurately. Now, one of the programs is time series photometry, which means that you observe the same target over many hours during a night, and on many nights, if you can do that, and then set the right uh, variation. Now, I started doing that as a participant uh, on invitation of the, uh, the Center of Backyard Astrophysics, which is based uh, with headquarters in the, at the Columbia University in New York. The CBI has a network over many time zones. So basically, when you do a light curve over the night, someone else in Chile can continue doing this, and you have a continuous light curve then New Zealand and Australia. So you can have, a, you, you see everything what happens to the star. And that you do often for when certain uh, stars go in, in, in eruption after being awaited to do that for years and then suddenly it happens and this is usually done. Sometimes you're invited to follow up on alerts or complementing satellite-based observations and then you also do that uh, in co cooperation with these people. They do a lot of exploration uh, targets as well, just to find out what, what actually happens there. The second program regarding uh, cataclysmic variables is uh, observing them uh, periodically. Uh, snap snapshot photography over, let's say, once a month, twice a month and then to uh, keep track of the light curve. 
This is a story we I just showed a, a, a chart from. It's a polar, and here I keep results for for the observations in 2002. It's about 10 years uh, of time here, and that is the magnitude when it's faded here and brighter uh, if you go down. And you can see over the, over these 10 years that star has become uh, gradually brighter, and occasionally it will have outbursts of a certain magnitude. Time series multiplicity of the same stars during um, a bright stage is shown here. It was a, it's about six hours of observations and it shows actually the, a full period of this star's light curve. It is really repeating the light curve. This is the same as that and the the same for, uh, for another four hours and a half. Nearly the same light curve. This is uh, a schematic presentation of polar, like this one is, and in fact it just dumps, there is no occasion disk, but it just dumps the material there via columns, and if it's an ecliptic system you can see uh, uh, a nice uh, how, how this uh, eclipse works. <coughs> this is another star which has, I have been monitoring for some time, and I found that it has some outbursts of times, and I have done uh, time series photography during the outburst and also during quiet sites. Well, you can see the difference between those curves uh, is quite uh, dramatic. Only in this point, which corresponds to each other, you have the same light of the system. But all other times during the period, this shows a higher value of the light. And that is because the extra light comes from that part that is eclipsed at that moment. And that light is then extra here and it's not there. Now in addition to this, I found this uh, star, if it eclipsed, you can see the, the period of the orbit on it. And this period is about seven and a half hours. And it's quite interesting that uh, to find such a long period for a star like that. And by repeating these measurements uh, on other days and on weeks and months and years, always bigger gaps, you can have a very long baseline to determine a precise and accurate uh, period for the star. So I, I arrived at this value of You know, the interesting science is, is if someone else does a couple of years' time and he can find different values. Because this is a uh, accuracy up to the, uh, to the second, second level. So it can easily be seen if this uh, system speeds up or not. This is another star which shows often, uh, it's mostly faded than eight and a half magnitude, but at times it shows an outburst, and time series photography show uh, there's not much to be seen really. In, in contrast to a star like VW Hydri, which shows very large amplitude uh, modulation when it is in outburst. This is a star that was considered to be a large nova, but I didn't know for sure. And I monitored it for a while and I couldn't get answers to this. And I decided to do time series photometry and I found this. Now, this is the signature of a our, our Lira variable. This is not a large number. So you I found others like that. This is a long term uh, light curve of a polar QS telescopium. In the beginning it used to be quite bright and faded gradually, then it brightened again and I don't know that a cycle goes that if I can have another ten years of it, then I probably know much more about it. So I had to keep on doing these and I made a selection of stars that really deserve uh, the regular observing. This is an intermediate polar that's also a cataclysmic variable with a magnetic field, but not a strong. It has been seen at 17 magnitude in the beginning and brightened up. Again, I don't know where it's going, but I think this is also interesting enough to see in the future. Another interesting one is uh, magnetic CP is WX Pixinis. It has a uh, nearly constant magnitude around 17 most of the time, but at times it really seems to extinct that it doesn't get any occasion going a lot. 
So that is also interesting to see how often this happens. Time series follow the, uh, sorry, done on a night show that the, this is only less than a magnitude that it, that it changes uh, continuously. So this cannot explain what happens there when it fades so deeply. This one is different. You have deep eclipses here and you know definitely this, this uh, system in Italy has a certain period that can be derived from your tables. These are eight hours of microquasar uh, activity during a bright phase. This one was very active, probably uh, this is a black hole system probably, with, uh, which had access to some material to, to gobble in and uh, that's the reaction to that. There is no periodicity in this. This is time series photometry of uh, a minor planet. This is a very peculiar system. I can't go into details here, but it, I found that because it was at the time not being explained what it really was. So it's very interesting to find out what it really is. Proxima Centaur is a little bit on many nights just to see uh, if it is, has a transiting exoplanet or so. And I found that there were some flares coming in. Used to be flares of 0.1 magnitude, but uh, I repeated on several nights to see what happened. And on that date, I found uh, quite a big flare happening there. And if you enlarge this and you look at the, the, the observing specs, then you see that this flare builds up in uh, something like 15 seconds and then it decays over minutes. So there are the diverse merits of uh, diverse merits to these programs, but I'm not going to go into detail because I have still something to show. I've been doing super researching and since 2002 by uh, establishing a very well researched uh, list of targets and that involved a lot of studying, a lot of studying of uh, galaxies, uh, types and, and supernova rates and different types and what to expect and also to, to try to get a grasp of distances. All in all, it produced then uh, a top thousand list of galaxies that are uh, accessible from the southern hemisphere. And I used that one to uh, regularly uh, observe in accordance to the individual merits, because of the better galaxies you want to be more often than those that are not so good. Okay, the observing that also then determined that uh, by the estimated expected. Uh, uh, magnitudes of supernova that might occur. It has been a quite successful program so far. Now, quickly here, uh, there are two types of supernova, the core collapse uh, variety, type 2 and so on, and the type 1a where you have a, an accreting white bar going over to limit and then explode. So, these types are usually more, uh, more uh, energetic, but this one is, is uh, give you more light. The supernova that I can show you here, it's about 350 light, a million light years from here. It's actually still quite uh, uh, close, but it is, uh, you can see it's phase on. You see two foreground stars, and here you see the supernova that are discovered, and it's uh, taken around maximum light, and here you can still see after two months. It's still there, but really getting out of view. This is a light curve of another type 1A supernova, of uh, another supernova, and, and you can see it, it was discovered well at least a week before maximum light, which is always very good. I mean, people that uh, uh, if you do that, they follow up on that and making nice light curves in different uh, wavelength bands, in different filters. This is the first supernova I had. It's covered visually, and these, these are the series of pictures uh, that uh, are made by the people from the Carnegie Supernova Project. They do uh, measure uh, the spectra, and they do measure the different bands and, and make different light curves in order to compensate for uh, like intergalactic distance scales. I'm sure you will see where the supernovas are. Here it is in a bright H2 uh, region. 
in the Gemini galaxy. This galaxy found two supernovas separated by six months. This supernova was the first one to find it's still visible there. In 2010, uh, another supernova occurred in this galaxy also. I was two, days, two nights too late for that one. Okay, well, so this one is nice. Uh, uh, supernova right in the front of the galaxy, that's why it is not extinguished, and that's why it is still nice and blue. Others here, and actually, it's like that after us. Because, uh, I would have gotten a nice time. Look, this is the discovery image of a supernova there. You cannot see it. But this image was taken during dawn, right on the horizon in the east. I see this star and, and somewhere there's another one and I know that the galaxy center is here and this is a new detection. That's how the galaxy normally works. And that's how it now looked after two weeks with the, with the supernova there. So that tells you how supernova are found. These are not nice images but it's a fit for purpose. And this very nearby galaxy made sure that we could see that supernova for more than a year. It's a nice image that I'm very impressed with always. Uh, another nearby galaxy in Sculptor. Uh, this um, galaxy uh, is one of the most close by here, uh, uh, except for the Magellanic clouds here. And here you can see on the next image I found something there which looked like a supernova, but that never became bright enough. And in fact, I told them Grid to hold back the designation just to, until we know what it really is. And it turned out to be an uh, optical transit, not a supernova, but something much brighter than a nova, but not as bright as a supernova. And in fact, two years later, I found one there of different nature, but also the same principle, an in between stage of uh, explosion. So the Sibyl star is. Program number four, it is a very uh, interesting uh, program, I would say. It, is, uh, it started in 2004 and had about 200 targets and uh, observed these in the V-band and uh, twice a month if could be. Very interesting systems, large systems with an uh, periosteron and uh, phase and, and, and and there's a lot of things that can happen, and there's so little known about these stars. There are no light curves available. I'm the first one to do that, and uh, I'm so amazed by the fine and how uh, it is that nobody in the north, northern hemisphere, does that there. I can show you light curve, but I think I'm running out of time. I'll just to give you a few the, uh, fading star systems. There are no data over these stars. Uh, the first one that I can show you here. Fading stars with a similar light curve does too. Here's something else. A star that tries to fade, rebrightens, goes up and oscillate there. A similar system there. Unrelated stars. Is that a feature after a periosteron? I don't know what it is. It really is something that I would like to find out. These are eight years of observations. A typical Myra type of uh, pulsation, eclipses, and you can measure the time, they range from 500 days to 1500 days for this one. Something else, an, an outburst on, on one of them, and two uh, stars that have get, gotten brighter lately here. Those two here, which we reported. So it's very interesting, I really want to know how it will go further. Uh, Kevin, I will stop here, I think that's all the right.